Hello, everyone. Good morning in Mexico and good afternoon in South Africa. Uh, my name is Arturo Mendoza Ramos. I am the director of the Mexican Studies Center. Welcome to our monthly webinar series, South South Dialogues. Uh, the aim of the webinar is to address existing and emerging challenges relevant to the developing world and to discuss subjects of international concern and research from the perspective of the Global South. Uh, today's webinar title is Present and Imminent Crisis and Complexity in Mexico and South Africa. We have a roundtable discussion convened by Professor Lenore Manderson, who will, be in, who will be in conversation with two Mexican scholars from the National uh, Autonomous University of Mexico and two scholars from um, the University of the Vid Bates Run in South Africa. Uh, please let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Manderson. Uh, she is a distinguished professor of public health and medical anthropology in the School of Public Health at the University of the Vid Bates Run. Uh, Professor Manderson is considered an NRFA rated scholar. Uh, for those who do not know this, this is the highest category awarded to researchers in South Africa based on the high quality and impact of their recent uh, research. Um, Professor Manderson is also affiliated uh, with Brown University in the United States and Monash University in Australia. Uh, she has made remarkable contributions to the understanding of inequality and the social context of infectious and chronic diseases in Australia, in Southeast and East Asia, and also in Africa. Her research has been disseminated in over 700 books, articles, book chapters, and reports. Um, she currently chairs the external review group of the Social Innovations in Health Initiative of TDR, and she is a member of the board of directors of the Society for Applied Anthropology. Uh, very recently, last year in January 2020, she was admitted as a member of the Order of Australia. Uh, thank you very much, Lenore, for being here today and for proposing this uh, exciting roundtable. And thank you very much to our UNAM and VITS uh, colleagues to participate in this webinar. Uh, Lenore, without uh, further ado, I will give you the floor now. Thank you very much. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be chairing this panel. And I think I feel enormously privileged um, that we're um, together um, and able to do this. Um, the um, Sorry, I'm just going to do something with this computer because I um, couldn't see my notes. Um, I think, I mean, it's a very rare experience where people can get together across three continents because I'm speaking from Australia at after 2 a.m. in the morning in your tomorrow. Um, but to have the six or so of us together online talking um, is a unique opportunity to talk about very common problems around um, climate and around responses to climate and particularly migration um, in the global south. And I guess we're much, um, we are used to reading and used to participating usually in conferences convened in the global north. And one of the advantages of this kind of dialogue is to strengthen south-south links and to share empirical examples, to build um, collaborations and build theory from the South in a very um, important and, and useful way. The people who are going to be participating on this panel are Christina Amitchin, um, who is from um, the Institute of Anthropological Research in the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And Christina um, is an anthropologist working on um, the um, it, around issues of anthropology and history. Um, she has been worked um, um, you, with awards um, for work in Lat um, recognizing her contribution to Latin American and Caribbean studies. And she's published chapters, books and book articles and is editor of Anthropologia Americana of the Pan American Institute of Geography and History. She's presently working on mobilities, inequalities, in interethnic relations, and on anthropology of tourism. And both of those themes, while they intersect, also stand independently, but they're also issues 
um, that are extremely relevant to people who are participating or, or listening at present in South Africa, both in terms of the inequalities of migrants and the way in which climate change has driven inequalities in all respects. And we'll come back to that momentarily. Paula Velasco is our second guest from um, UNAM and is a member of the Mexican National System of Researchers. She teaches environmental anthropology and political ecology, anthropological theory and methods. Um, and has worked on contamination, political economy, and rural populations in the Tavitas. Um, she is a prize-winning prize author recognized by the National Institute of Anthropology and History, and works particularly around issues of river population, uh, water over-exploitation, um, local manufacturing, and the conditions of precarity that produce further inequalities, including in health outcomes, but also in household status, education and employment, primarily in central Mexico. And again, her interests articulate with those in South Africa, where we routinely struggle with water governance, access to water, river pollution and groundwater pollution from industry. In South Africa, Joe Veery joins us. Joe is the director of the African Centre for Migration and Society at FITS and works both in public health and migration and the intersections of the two. She coordinates a migration and health project, Southern Africa, and the African Research University's Alliance Center of Excellence on Migration and Mobility. And has had, I know, considerable collaborations over the years with colleagues in um, Central and South America and North America and the Caribbean. And so is very familiar with the intersections, commonalities and differences across the global south in relation to both migration and health. Um, the, and is particularly interested in epistemic injustice. And again, I think that the question of social justice links together all our participants. The second speaker from South Africa is Kangalani Moyo, who is with the Global Change Institute, which has a strong focus on climate change, but also on other dimensions of change impacting South African society and the global South more generally. His work has been on migrant mobilities in urban spaces and spatial identity. So he brings to this conversation a strong um, geographic perspective um, when he looks at migration management at refugee governance and transnationalism and at the social vulnerabilities in the urban periphery. And as everybody particip participating in this are well aware, these are very live and real issues in South Africa, more broadly in Southern Africa and also in Mexico. So if I can, and I showed, sorry, I had, let me just, sorry, I was busy talking and did not. So Paula, who you meet, Kangalani, who you will meet, Christina and Joe, and they're the panelists. And the quick answer to that is to not use screen sharing when you're busy reading and trying to think on your feet concurrently, or you end up um, overwhelmed by all of the slides that are open. I think that in many respects, I've said what I was going to say by a way of int introduction, and that was to bring together the ways in which climate change and migration came together um, to provoke us to think about the nature of society, the nature of government, the responsibilities of citizens, and um, the crises that occur and are likely to occur, and hence the choice of a title to profile imminence that is looming 
challenges, as well as the challenges we're living with at present. But I was influenced by that um, some 15 or more years ago when I had a doctoral student working in Zimbabwe under Mugabe at a time at which there was drought and a lot of migration from rural to urban areas. And during a period of hyperinflation and increasing violence, people who were squatting or had built their own homes and were living in cities such as Harare um, had their homes destroyed and were, were um, stripped of any capacity to live. Now, historically, people had a strong relationship between rural and urban, whereby um, food flowed from rural areas and cash from urban areas during this period, as is increasingly happening under climate change and global warming, there is no, not enough food being produced in rural areas to remit to the cities and not enough cash being earned from the cities to flow back to rural areas. Now, climate change is only one factor that contributes to that um, interacting or intersecting immiseration, if, if you will, but it's a significant one. And where we're facing challenges over land ownership, drought, um, extreme weather events and so on, we are likely to see a greater flow of people into cities and into cities which are very poorly able to address growing populations, to provide for the infrastructure or for the social structure to accommodate those kinds of changes. So I want to start with Paula and Kangalani as anthropologists with interests in ecology, the environment, space and population and migration. And I'm going to ask Paula first to talk about your research and the issues that have struck you in your own work. Thank you. Thank you, Lenore. Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. I'm really thrilled to be talking to you, like you said, in different continents. Arturo, thank you. Um, I don't want to take too much time so because I really want to have a dialogue with you guys. So I am um, currently working on two projects. The first initiated in 2009, and it's the one that I want to talk about right now, has been interested in the configuration of very complex socio-environmental entanglements and the new subjectivities produced by the articulation of an array of subjects and processes like the pollution of, the, of a river, water over exploitation, historical conditions of precarity, health problems in Tlaxcala, Mexico, in the central part of Mexico. So this project tries to advance ethnographic inquiries on the mutual production of society and nature and how these entanglements are shaped by historically and spatially situated political economies and the local expression of capitalist relations. So um, first about what you inquired about uh, the, the relation between uh, climate change, migration, employment. Uh, I first want to set apart a little bit my uh, climate change because I haven't researched it directly, although of course uh, the population I've been working with, uh, there's evidence that there's almost two degrees uh, of increase on the climate in the valley since the last three or four decades. There are uh, uh, intense, more intense droughts and rainfalls, but people in the valley before they experienced this have also experienced all their environmental changes in a more conspicuous and long lasting manner, which that's, that's what I want to address right now. So I have found that the change in the environment historically, food security and employment are processes that are intimately related and mutually dependent. Um, the people I've been working with live in the plains of the Valley of Tlaxcala that, are, that is located in the center of Mexico. And this is a very privileged area because of the surface and subsurface water runoff that comes from the hilly parts of the valley. This runoff fills the underground water deposits and makes the valley soils very fertile and humid. So for centuries, this water dominated the landscape and set the pace and rhythm of all in its inhabitants, human and, and non-human included. 
So the heart of this valley used to be a very rich lacustrine ecosystem that hosted prosperous pre-Hispanic sites like Acaxtla and Xochitecatl, and later Spanish enclaves, Indian congregations, rich haciendas that produced mainly wheat and maize, but it is so fertile that it, they could produce almost anything. But in the wake of the 20th century, the lakes were drained off for the expansion of agricultural fields and the lacustrine way of life was ended. Five decades later, in, in 1960, the, the region experienced a very dramatic transformation when thousands of hectares of agricultural fields were used to install industries. First, a Volkswagen plant, then a petrochemical complex uh, owned by the government, and a steelwork company that preceded hundreds and hundreds of other industries arranged near the main rivers and tributaries in the valley. So today you can find almost all kinds of industries in this region, uh, but very few people get employed in those industries. And actually, since the 1940s, they started migrating to Mexico City. So it's a very long history of migration. Pendular, it was not permanent. And um, they started multiplying their economic activities. I mean, not only agriculture, but one person could be uh, uh, working on their plot, uh, but also working in, a, in a industry in Mexico City or domestic work or whatever. Now, Besides the a huge amount of water extracted by the, the industries in the region, all of them discharge, discharge their wastewater directly to the water streams or the municipal drains without any treatment, causing serious problems in the region. For the, because both for the number of toxic products discharged in the water streams and because of the multiple chemical reactions that can arise and that, has, that have arised, from the contact between the different substances between uh, present in the river flow. So it is enough to be in the vicinity of the rivers to perceive a very penetrating and foul chemical odor. The only thing that floats on the river now are plastic bags, plastic bottles, and of course, some microscopic bacteria resistant to toxics, but all of the other fauna has disappeared and the humans living in the, in the area have become ill for the last 50 years. This situation has threatened basic human rights to health, to a clean environment and the subsistence itself. For various reasons, including lack of wells and permissions from the government to, to um, dig wells. And because of the lack of resources, a good number of farmers throughout the region are forced to continue watering their lands with the contaminated waters and to have direct contact with these waters when it's time for placing the dams or breaking the boards to irrigate their plots. So crops such as green tomatoes, corn, amaranth, alfalfa, and beans continue to grow, but other vegetables rot or are otherwise affected by the chemicals content of the water. And the irrigation is done as before by flooding the, the plots, no? So in addition to the dangers to the human health and the productive continuity of the region, Pollution has modified social dynamics, health, food, and even recreation activities. The inhabitants of the region that are aged over 30 remember that both rivers, as well as the ditches and canals served as places of recreation, fun, and family. There were uh, a lot of springs where, that provided fresh water. In many of the ditches, you can find fresh watercress, um, a plant that along with other different kinds of kelites, which are, which are highly nutritious leafy green vegetables, sprouted wildly in the cornfields due to the natural moisture of the soil and was part of a very rich diet provided by the lacustrine agricultural ecosystem. The contamination of all these sources of water and of the land um, uh, has halted all of these activities and the nutritious diet it provided. So now the ingestion of processed foods has risen, obesity rates are increasing in dramatic numbers, and obesity, among other fa health factors, increase their vulnerability when exposed to toxins. So uh, just to mention a few of the health problems found in the area that are deeply related to the pollution of water and air are leukemia, thrombocytopenic purpura, different types of cancer, kidney disorders, congenital malformations, and most importantly, they have found genotoxic damage, which means that they are, um, that their ailments are, are, are being uh, uh, passed through the generations. 
The transformation of the region has been drastic and dramatic. From being a lacustrine ecosystem, it became a buoyant agricultural valley and later the backyard of polluting industries, which has ended fertility, modified the ways of life of these inhabitants, changed the way in which they relate to the environment that surrounds them, deteriorated their health and endangered their future. So the unequivocally sociocultural, economic and religious history of the valley is from start to finish related to water. What in one day supported life is now a source of illness and a brutal expression of capitalist inequalities. So this has left people in the valley pretty vulnerable and underprepared, and I think that's an understatement, physically, physically and socially to confront problems like climate change that are now affecting the valley and of course the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that was... Um amazing and I mean fascinating but it's also listening to you there are so many resonances and it is around the degradation of fertile lands by industry the appropriation by industry of those lands and the immiseration that follows from that and I think your um, last comment around the brutality of capitalism um, is really um provocative and um, to the point and, and deeply worrying, um, given that we're still dealing with that, including with we, surveillance capitalism and predatory capitalism, but the brutality of what you're describing really co compounds how we think about these issues and the way in which um, things have changed so dramatically. Kangalani, can I ask you to come in now? Um, you've been working on the environment and, and um, migration. I mean, your PhD was on migration and you've worked in the inner city. So um, Paola spoke of um, people being forced out of agriculture and into the city. And that has been true both locally, rural to urban and inter-country migration in South Africa. So if you would like to pick this up now and talk a bit about your research, that would be wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lino. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be part of this uh, esteemed panel and to be in conversation with, uh, you know, uh, scholars from, uh, uh, from Mexico. Uh, as I was uh, listening to Paula uh, talking about the situation in, uh, in Mexico, it was quite fascinating uh, because she speaks of uh, internal dynamics when it comes to, um, to migration and also uh, the effects that you know, climate change is having on, on you know, rural uh, populations. Uh, within Southern Africa, I mean, there is quite a, you know, a, a, different, um, a different but similar uh, picture. You know, uh, the issue of rural to urban, migra uh, to urban migration is not lost, but uh, what we see in many instances is a, a situation where, because when you look at Southern Africa, we have South Africa, which is at the center in terms of, um, you know, uh, people moving to, uh, to the cities of Johannesburg, uh, Cape Town and, and, you know, and, and other, you know, agricultural and, you know, mining areas. So within, we, we, we have, um, you know, a kind of, um, uh, I don't know how to, how to put it, but um, so it is not uh, easy to look at South Africa alone without looking at the role that you know regional you know uh, migration uh, plays. So um, so there is something that I call the um, cross border urbanization, uh, specifically looking at uh, migrants from uh, Zimbabwe and migrants from um, uh, from Lesotho and um, and Mozambique. These are neighboring uh, countries, which are the major contributors uh, to the migrant population in, um, uh, in South Africa. And many of these uh, migrants migrate from you know, rural regions in their areas, and um, they are 
first urban experience is in uh, in cities in South Africa, uh, because when you look at uh, the there is inequality in terms of um, urban populations in South Africa and uh, the regional the regional neighbors. Um, so. Well, I have just latched onto that uh, a topic, but my work generally uh, focuses on, you know, on, on Southern African uh, migration, and I've touched a bit on the uh, Zimbabwe South Africa migration uh, corridor. There's also the Lesotho South Africa migration corridor and the Mozambique South Africa migration corridor, which are all influenced by, you know, different uh, dynamics. If you look at the Zimbabwe South Africa migration corridor, you have uh, a situation of economic and uh, political instability that has persisted uh, for for a long time, and um, so which again makes it quite difficult when you look at issues of uh, you know environmental um, you know driven environment driven um, migration because there is always an intersection with issues of uh, you know, uh, the politics and, and also uh, the economic um, uh, performance of, of, you know, of, of these migrant contributing um, uh, countries. So with Mozambique, with the Mozambique South Africa migration corridor, you have a long history of migrants coming into the, into the, to work in the mines and that established a long tradition of people moving uh, from Mozambique to uh, to South Africa, and Mozambique has been, uh, you know, beset by uh, you know extreme weather uh, events. Uh, it is not easy to pin down uh, these directly as contribute as contributing to you know massive movements of people from Mozambique to to South Africa. But if you take that as a kind of a multiplier in terms of uh, the vulnerabilities that you know people experience in, in 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 countries like Mozambique, which have poor performing economies, and also the established roots of uh, you know people coming from those areas into into South Africa, then you can immediately you know uh, project that you know over the long term uh, with you know the increase in extreme weather events and uh, you know. Um, so you are likely to see more people moving into, into the urban areas in South Africa and uh, of which I think touching again on, on the point that Paula raised. So when you see these people moving into, into these cities, uh, these cities are not exactly prepared to handle you know, uh, large movements of people because South Africa itself has to deal with its own internal, you know, uh, migrants that are coming into the in cities. Actually, um, you know, these are the largest contingent of uh, migrants, you know, followed by those, of course, from the neighboring countries. You have a lot of people migrating. So as, um, as, 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 as we see, uh, you know, Southern, Af Southern Africa is actually um, uh, one of the most affected, you know, uh, you know areas in terms of um, uh, global Global warming and the effect in terms of um, you know agricultural productivity we have seen an increase or rather uh, a frequency of uh, drought um, you know uh, events. Um, I think most recently uh, there was an issue around you know uh, water issues in, in in Cape Town and the entire country, of course, but Cape Town almost had a, a day zero event. Uh, so um, within the Global Change Institute, they call these uh, tipping uh, tipping points. So you you so so as um, I think as 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 we move into the uh, future, we're most likely to see um, a lot of uh, directly you know a, a lot of movement that is directly linked to the changes in the uh, in the in the environment and. Uh, that leads me to some of my work around, uh, you know, migration management and uh, refugee uh, governance. You know, so uh, what uh, I, what I have observed uh, together with, uh, you know, my uh, uh, collaborators. So what we have observed uh, is a, you know, uh, South Africa becoming increasingly restrictive 
when it comes to accepting you know, refugees and asylum seekers into the country. So that actually, that has implications for the future because we're most likely to see a lot of movement driven by you know, uh, failures in governance, for instance, in, in, in countries like uh, uh, Zimbabwe and that coupled with you know, uh, drought events you know, um, you know, and productive you know, agriculture it means that there is a well still going to see a lot of you know and and, and that doesn't bode well with a restrictive um with a restrictive and exclusionary um you know uh environment so um I'll, I'll leave it there for now and you know um, and i'm happy to uh to uh, to engage further as we go thank you thank you um, I'm struck by your comment around the scope of all the importance of internal migration as a feature of, of, of the city and urbanisation. And of, we do tend to focus, I think, I mean, within countries as a political issue on, on people who are not citizens, rather on the plight of people who are citizens, who see very little choice but to migrate to cities. Um, Christina and Joe, you've both worked on motivations for migration, and you've both linked this to insecurity, both insecurity at home source as a factor resulting in migration and the insecurities that follow from that when people do migration. So on arrival in the host community and so on. And I guess I mean insecurity in terms of politics, in political insecurity, and of course, citizenship for people without papers and therefore access to health services and other services, but housing insecurity, food insecurity, personal insecurity, violence, and so on. And Christina, you've worked particularly on migration and violence as one of your interests, but I'd like to hear from you firstly about your most recent research on migration. Hi. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now I am working with uh, tourism because it is a very important topic in the economy of Mexico. And it is a polo, un polo de atracción. <laughs> eh, there are many cities who are gathered migrants of different places of Mexico. Now, I will tell you about mass tourism and climate change. And I will speak about some aspects of reflection in times of COVID. The next. Okay, okay. According to global estimates, more than one point billion international tourism arrivals were registered worldwide in 2019 with which is equivalent to almost a fifth of the world's population. Tourism is responsible for the creation of more than 120 million jobs who, whose direct contribution to world GDP was $2 trillion according to the World Tourism Organization. Natural and cultural resources are the main attra attractions for the generation of tourist products are being affected by anthropic global warming. In addition, tourism is an agent of climate change by emitting greenhouse gases that contribute to increasing the warming process, especially due to the movement of people and the use of means of transporting people and food. Mm -hmm. Mass tourism in a source of pollution 
of the deterioration of natural resources due to the often predatory consumption. This is clear in the case of emerging countries as Mexico, which have seen their coastlines and forests affected by the tourism and the real estate industry. The second one. Ah, okay. Uh, now, nowadays we are we are working on different places in Mexico and different issues related to tourism from an anthropological perspective. But we are working too with sociologists and geographers in the university and other institution of Mexico and Latin America. In Mexico tourism has become one of the main economic activities in the country, having regions with a wild biodiversity and natural resource of high landscape value, historic centers in the cities, archeological sites, uh, wild cultural diversity supported by its more than 63 indigenous people and a history that dates back more than 3,000 years. In addition, given its geographical proximity to the United States and Canada, it makes the tourism a high attractive uh, economic activity because it is next to the one of the main places of origin of of tourists. Uh, the economic importance of tourists is reflected in the generation of employment. It is estimated that around 2.3 million people work directly in tourism in Mexico. For 2019, uh, tourists contribute with 8.3% of the uh, of the country gross domestic product. This made tourism the third source of foreign exchange, only below all the remittance sent by migrants working in the United States and the products of the oil. The enormous dependence of tourism, however, has become one of the greatest vulnerabilities. With the arrival of COVID, tourism activities were strongly affected. Many people lost their jobs uh, and we have to look what other activities we have to promote for the development uh, with these activities. Uh, hence, it is necessary to think of alternatives that allow the development of short distance tourist project, the strengthening, the strengthening of family and community business, the development of domestic tourists, and seeking alternative that make the country less dependent on mass tourism. Thank you very much. It is the thing that we are working right now with other uh, colleagues in Mexico and Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm struck by your comment because again, we have a direct parallel and um, I've not seen the figures for job losses as a result of tourism, but I certainly know that in South Africa, those who own tourist venues are down on numbers and are struggling and trying to encourage people back. And there is clearly um, a flow on from that um, as people lose work and or move from full-time to part-time work or contract work. Um, impacting on rural economies and so therefore leading to increased movement to the cities. 
Joe, you've worked a lot on rural to urban migration and um, on environmental challenges again. Um, but I wondered if you could, in talking about your research, um, address questions around the reverse flow from urban to rural areas. Now, I know that occurred 20 odd years ago in the early years of HIV. Um, where people were literally went home to die, but from AIDS before there were ARVs available. But I wonder whether there is a continuing trend and what the impact on rural areas are with that reverse flow. Um, afternoon, morning, hello everyone. Um, thanks again to Arturo and the Centre for, for bringing us all together. Um, I wish we were in person and hopefully one day in the future. <laughs> um, thanks, Lenore. I think that one of the first things is probably to emphasize Kangalani's point earlier about the fact that the movement of people within their countries of birth tends to be far more prevalent and far more important in terms of development challenges for the state and the need for good governance than the movement of people from across borders. And South Africa has this long, complex and messy um, and problematic past in, in looking at the ways in which people were either forcibly moved in different ways, but importantly around the creation of the homeland system um, where black South Africans were removed essentially from the Republic um, and were possibly in many cases in urban centers of, of South Africa and in the mining um, areas. And this was about the movement of individual young men in particular, um, who moved on their own. They were not able to bring families with them. They lived in single sex um, migrant worker hostels. And it was very much as a temporary measure. Um, it was about keeping people out. It was about being able to take use, you know, make use of a, a disposable migrant body um, for the benefit of, of industry. And so, as Lenore mentioned, um, over time, we saw this, um, this movement being associated with various other forms of sort of infectious disease, firstly with syphilis, tuberculosis, HIV. But these patterns were about something complicated that wasn't only about the movement of individuals to the cities and the contexts in which they were living, putting them at increased risk of acquiring particular infectious diseases. But it's about the ways that these individuals, when they were unwell, returned home or when they were well and returned home regularly and their relationships with partners and families in their communities from which they've come. But in those spaces, when these individuals were away working in the mines or in the cities, other people, their partners, their wives, et cetera, were also continuing to have different social relations and sexual relationships in those spaces. So we see this very complex interplay of, of the ways in which um, health manifests. We still see the pattern today of people returning to their places of origin should they become too sick to work. So whether we're looking at urban centers, whether we're looking at secondary towns, whether we're looking at people who've moved from peripheral urban areas into the central city, we tend to see people returning to their, um, their home communities when they need um, social and health support. And this has several factors, which I think fit into this kind of complex space is around the ways that people acquire poor health in the context in which they're working due to a range of injustices around an inability to access positive determinants of health. So people are forced to live and work in conditions which are not um, contributing to good health, for example. So the burden of that poor health is not then felt in the city. The burden is felt by the home community, by the home household, by the home health system and so forth. And it also, if an individual becomes unwell, that also then interrupts their ability to be earning, to be sending money home in terms of remittances. Um, so there's, there's a range of complicated issues there. And I think more recently, we're starting to see how this has played out in the context of COVID. Um, and for example, lockdown measures and um, travel 
restrictions in South and Southern Africa. And what this has meant for people who have lost employment, um, but haven't been able to return to their home communities or returned home and are now, able not, are now unable to return to, to, to the city. Um, and this is having an impact also for those moving across, across borders. Um, so I'm, I, I wonder if I can sort of use that as a way, Lenore, to, to sort of look at what this means in terms of sort of a neglected area with, when we're looking at issues around you know, crises and complexities and whether kind of neglecting these forms of movement and these particular um, impacts and affects and manifestations of, of different regulations and regulations of bodies. Most recently, we're seeing that in the context of COVID. Um, and what that then means for access to, to, um, to, to justice, what that means in terms of the way that um, insecurities can manifest, Lenore, as you were talking about earlier. And I guess I just wanted to use the last couple of minutes to really try and sort of bring us to thinking about why is it that we're neglecting particular issues in this complex and contested field um, of these globally connected, interlinked um, and you know, entwined um, challenges. And I think one of the ways that we see some of this play out is that these issues are neglected not only at a global level, um, in terms of who physically located where geopolitically um, is considered and engaged, but also at a much more local level. So who's left behind? Who's left out? Who's ignored? Um, and we can see the way that this manifests in various forms of allowing the state to potentially scapegoat and blame others. And we see this in the case of migration, not only blaming foreign nationals, um, unfairly without any evidence, um, but also some blame around the movement of South Africans within their country of birth. And forgetting that this movement is embedded in the social fabric due to a history of injustice. Um, so what does it mean when we're neglecting to look at these kinds of issues? And I think that most recently we've seen this obviously play out um, in the ways in which, you know, the, the COVID pandemic has has really pushed many of these challenging issues to the, to the ground, to the fore. So we know that these unfounded fears around um, the dangers that are perceived by the state or perceived by the public of, of people who move, and as we're seeing this being increasingly policed in the context of COVID, um, it's allowing states also the opportunity to co-opt a, a different form of a security agenda, the global health security agenda and apply that in potentially dangerous ways, particularly around international borders. Um, and we've seen the ways in which, you know, this kind of persistent fear and presumed threat of a foreign body is being, um, is again being used to restrict movement. We're seeing in this complex, you know, in sort of transnational world, the ways in which states are trying to um, reclaim um, you know, issues around sovereignty and protection of their populations. Um, and we're seeing that play out in different ways. Uh, I, I'll stop there, Lenore, but um, yeah, I mean, if there's a chance to come back to some of the, the, the sort of ways in which a, a pandemic is really bringing these complexities to the fore, that would be, um, that'd be great, thanks. I thank you for that. Um, in fact, thank you all four of you for some really thoughtful contributions to this debate. Um, Arturo, just as a, um, in parenthesis, I assume that you're looking at Facebook to see if any of the people watching this have any questions and you'll bring it to us, right? Yes, sorry, I just forgot to say that. Like I already told people on Facebook, if they have any questions or comments, uh, they, they can they can share that with, with us on Facebook and then I will share that with you here. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that I'd actually like to deviate from, from how I was planning to follow this discussion because I think that um, uh, Christina and Joe, especially, but all four speakers have touched on the present moment and the crisis of the present, which is a crisis that has been 
brought, uh, intensified by COVID, but it really is a crisis of awareness of the ways in which um, systems of government and systems of industry and the organisation of labour and um, so and colonialism have all impacted on everyday lives. And then, as Joe's just said, who gets left out in that context? And the the constellation of all those things have been and and have been meaning like in in the early 2000s referred to as wicked problems that is you can only deal with problems by taking a multi-dimensional approach and and for us as researchers therefore also a multidisciplinary approach but in resolving the wicked problems you're also talking about intersectoral engagement at the level of government and that's really become very apparent in the US because of the intersection of Black Lives Matter and um, the pandemic and um, the collapse of a dignified government in the US um, uh, palpably, but, and maybe being retrieved right now. But I wonder if we could actually pursue that and talk firstly about the way in which you and your colleagues, Joe, we'll start with you, um, are able to work across dif those different questions to bring them together and the challenges of doing that and how you then engage with government and indeed with um, the private sector and the third sector around those issues. Um, and relating to that, the extent to which academically um, COVID has pushed people to think about other kinds of challenges um, in society. For example, is uh, people, uh, South Africa has always been very clear about its racist part and past, but particularly about the historic legacy of apartheid and not between countries. And whether in fact, because things were pushed and relations were provoked, um, with in the last year, whether there's been growing discourse around racism in the country. Sorry, that's two questions, I'm afraid. One's about intersector, intersectional approaches and intersectoral engagement and multidisciplinary projects, I guess. And the other one is about what has COVID revealed? Thanks, Lenore. Um, so I think as you say, one of the key challenges that we face is around working out what skills are needed for us to do the academic work around thinking through these complexities, um, these so-called wicked problems. Um, and I think this is one of the biggest challenges because very few um, of us, particularly within the academy, if we can say that, have the skill set needed to act as an interlocutor to bring these different actors together. So this is about people from different disciplines within a university, sort of in that physical space. It's about bringing together practitioners in conversation. And then it's about bringing all those other governance actors, whether we're talking about the state, civil society, um, community rights groups, advocacy groups, international organizations, and it's really about seeing governance as this whole, which is, you know, the, the whole of society approach is something absolutely essential, but I don't think we figured out how to do it. Um, and I think that we need to be developing different ways of providing training opportunities for um, people across different sectors as they come through their, their university degrees, for example. How do we ensure that somebody responsible for border management understands and engages with somebody responsible for the delivery of antiretroviral drugs and is talking to somebody who's responsible for ensuring that we have um, safe access to banking facilities near the border? For example, right? These are the, some of the complexities that we need to really be able to engage with. We often end up either in echo chambers um, where we're speaking to others who are on side or we're in these very sort of volatile one-on-one head-to-head -on -one -head spaces where people are so frustrated at each other 
because there isn't an interlocutor, there isn't a system for bringing people together in a constructive way. So for me, it's really about thinking about what we need to do differently in our training. Um, and that's not only within a university system, but, but how do we bring people, um, a, a group of people who have the skills to see themselves as more of as generalists, sort of jacks of all trades as you were, who are willing and interested in playing that role in bringing people together. And I, I think public health, I'm biased, but I think public health provides an opportunity for that. I think that the, the, pub, the field of public health does encourage building skills in ways that facilitate you reaching out. The problem is it's a question of who you are reaching, reaching out to. Um, and then one thing on that is if we're looking at framing this within neglect and complexity, we know that sort of intersectional approaches, we know that humanized research is neglected. It's neglected in terms of who funds it. It's neglected in terms of where it's funded and what is funded. We know that particularly in the field of research, the days of being able to develop a research project and apply for funding are over. We have to morph our research to priorities that are often defined elsewhere. Um, and I think particularly in the context we're all working, we often don't see our realities reflected in the funding that's made available. So I think there's something really important that links into issues around epistemic injustice and the way we need to, to think about that. Um, just in terms of your other point, Lenore, I think COVID has actually made, this is one example of something it has made visible. Um, I've definitely seen that COVID, not only has it made um, visible many of challenges of, of um, justice no exists and it's made it more visible and perhaps has reached more people but COVID has simply made visible these injustices that already exist but a key issue I think we do need to be talking about is how COVID has also unmasked for many um, the ways in which this kind of neglect of lower middle income country um, research driven agendas um, the the rush for parachute research being done virtually the rush for rapid partnership development with colleagues in northern contexts um, but at the same time struggling to access operational research funding here or funding to access and build partnerships or communities of practice um, and that's something that our center is involved in some initiatives to look at around that this COVIDization of research um, and what that means for the big academic project, but importantly, what it means for issues around epistemic injustice and who continues to be neglected. Um, so I think some really complicated areas there that I think should be considered one of these new um, complex and kind of crises. I think epistemic injustice is at its most, it's at the breaking point right now. Right. Um, Paula, can I um, ask you to pick up on some of those questions, including because um, you talked earlier about the degradation of land, about water pollution, about unemployment, about migration, about climate change, about inequalities and more. And you personally bring together a range of different skills in, 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 able, in order to articulate those issues in the first instance. So I'd, I'd like to hear from you again, questions around um, intersectoral approaches and the policy implications of your work and the challenges of doing that. And of course, those challenges are made enormously difficult um, in the present moment in Mexico, both for political reasons and because of course, right now COVID is having such a terrible effect on the country. Yes, thank you. It's, it's, it has been a very difficult task to do all this um, um, uh, articulation between different, uh, articulate like environmental problems with social problems, historical problems. But I think um, I've been working with grassroots uh, NGOs for a, for a while now, and uh, I think it's a very good opportunity for researchers to to um, to approach these persons that have problems and try to 
try to make your your research available to them and and uh, and try to try to think in solutions that are not necessarily that don't go necessarily through the eyes of the the experts right i mean I, I think everyone expert is expert in their own fields including the communities that we work with so um i think covid 19 has revealed that this is what I what I tell to my students too that it dep it 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 matters how you define a problem. It matters if you define a problem like COVID nineteen as a mere health problem, then you're not going to have a good solution. So you need to articulate everything that's inside the COVID nineteen pandemic, and if you define it as an environmental a health problem, a social problem, a historical problem that combines issues of inequality, issues of, 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 um, of uh, unequal re power relations, then you can produce a more integrated solution for, for this problem. And of course, this is a very difficult um, position because even if, if you have a lot of information and research about these kinds of problem, the articulation with government agencies well has been historically very very difficult to access because uh, uh, in 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 the research I've been doing most of the well good part of the pollution is made by the government itself itself because the petrochemical plant is their own and because of course they have prioritized uh, other kind of of, of issues like. Uh, uh, giving more power to transnational industries or uh, of, um, some kind of elites, and but I think it's 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 a very good time to engage in multidisciplinary research, and I think uh, I don't I don't want to sell this as I am talking uh, as as I am talking about the our actual government that kind of see like, oh, it's the best. But I think they're, they're, um, they have a very good uh, intention in producing one sort of new program, which are the projects to, for solving, the name is um, Research and Impact National Projects, which are actually thinking of articulating these grassroots uh, NGOs uh, researches from all kinds of different disciplines, um, other kind of civil so societies, government officials, and they're trying to solve very specific problems. So I think it's a very good idea. I'm a little bit skeptical about how it's going to turn out. Uh, I am part of two of those projects, but I think it's a very good start to, to, to start thinking in a more integrated way, in an intersectional manner, and uh, and it really stroke what what Joe said about who's being left out, and I think it's time uh, for researchers also because sometimes researchers are just like they say in their ivory tower working, you no, know, without really engaging with real life problems. So I think it's I think it's time, you no, know, if the if this pandemic doesn't give, I mean, doesn't push us push us there, then I don't know what is going to push us to work to solve like real life problems. Okay, I before I ask Kangalani your next, I want to ask you a question. Can I just give all four of you notice that I'm then after I've spoken to Kangalani and then to Christina, that I'm going to ask each of you to ask somebody else on the panel a question and hopefully we'll have some people from the Facebook audience um, prepared to ask some questions too. Um, Kangalani, the comments that Paolo made around engaging with communities and um, collaborating with NGOs and so on, um, I just wonder if you have reflections on the challenges with that for inner city migrants, as opposed to, for example, rural migrants. And I'm thinking around the numbers of migrants and particularly, I guess, from my own knowledge through students of people from Lesotho 
who live in the inner city, largely under bridges and along riverbeds. So they are homeless and often um, without papers. So they, they're in a position of um, being stripped of rights in every respect. And then those, you know, the, their basic capacity to live is consistently threatened and was before COVID. It has presumably been made worse since then. But I'd like to hear your views around how, as a researcher, you're able to engage and linking back to the earlier discussion around interdisciplinarity, you, um, your early work was with the department, with the with architecture at the university. So, how does architecture help um, provide the skills and the interests, um, or are you an outsider to that department, and that's why you've moved? I mean, what did it bring to your capacity to think around? in migration to the inner city? Uh, uh, thanks, Lino, for, uh, for throwing a, a live snake in my hands. <laughs> yeah, well, contrary, my earlier, you know, education was in sociology and, uh, you know, and then I had a stint in at, uh, the African Center for Migration and Society. And while well, being an outsider to the, um, you know, uh, School of Architecture and Planning, actually uh, it um, brought um, a, a new sense of, of, of understanding in terms of um, uh, the, the, the special side of, um, uh, of things, how migrants, you know, interact uh, with the special fabric of the city, and you mentioned something around um, around homelessness. Of course, in the last couple of years, uh, I've you know when you move around the inner city, you see a lot of people uh, you know on the streets who live on the streets. Uh, I think uh, part of it is a, a consequence of the um, lack of economic growth within South, South African economy, and you know the increasing number of the increasing percentages of unemployment so and and you can imagine um you know so uh citizens and and, and migrants are affected in in you know in, in equal measure by the broader structural issues but uh then in terms of the vulnerability migrants uh from especially these, those from neighboring countries are further affected you know, because they have moved across the borders and often they don't have as much capital, you know, uh, as, 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 internal, as internal migrants. And also they do not have so much of the state on their side. So, and, and that again uh, speak to, uh, speaks to a very, very sad reality within uh, South Africa, because uh, if you look at the, uh, how the pandemic played out, the initial response of the South African government was to exclude, uh, you know, in terms of excluding migrants and 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 uh, and, and asylum seekers, migrants from outside the country. So and and it took a court order by the uh, Scala Brini Center of Cape Town. You know, they took the government to court so that they could uh, at least extend the social grants to asylum seekers and uh, migrants who are on, you know, on special permits. So you can understand the struggle that is there. So when you put that in the context of uh, the varying degrees of vulnerability, you can uh, actually see how much, you know, uh, uh, migrants often, uh, at, you know, are at the worst uh, end and, and so, and that also speaks to the uh, role that NGOs play within the South African context, especially, um, and, and there's also an, an active type of engagement uh, within, NGO, within NGOs that are mainly in the uh, activism, activistic, uh, you know, uh, type of, you know, uh, work uh, with the academic, you know, uh, space. Uh, I, I think within uh, the, when you look at migrant, uh, you know, uh, and, and migration and health, particularly, there's been a vibrant, uh, you know, organizing there. I think uh, Provira has been at the center of that, 
you know, bring uh, different organizations uh, together and, and monitoring, you know, uh, you know, what is happening in that space and, and with a view to, you know, advocating and, and uh, forcefully actually um, arguing about this point of where there's selective, uh, you know, provisioning and, and often there's a kind of uh, statements from the government side that uh, consistently, uh, uh, you know, champion a line about, you know, exclude, uh, exclusion, which is, uh, which is quite a, you know, a, a said, uh, a said, um, a said reality within the South African uh, context. Sorry, um, I, I mean, of late, I've moved into the space of, you know, uh, looking at these issues of refugee governance and migration management. So I veered off the point about, you know, the, you know, uh, the point about migrant space and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. I mean, you've you've raised some really interesting points, and I think one of them is the the. I mean, you use the example of challenges to what was happening from Cape Town, and it is around the way in which civil society um, has has a presence in South Africa, and at the same time, you know, a very um, vibrant public discourse around issues that matter. So while Black Lives Matter seemed um, in much of the world to be a new discovery um, in the course of last year in South Africa, it's always been front and center in debates. I mean, you know, questions of transformation are not new for us and, and we are always mindful of it. Um, what, but you are talking. You have talked about cross-border migrants, and that does bring me back to you, Christina, um, which is around the fact that some that I mean, you were talking around migrant workers involved in the tourist industry, but of course the other major migration drift in Mexico is from Mexico into the U.S. either on a very temporary basis or on a more permanent basis. And linked to that also migration through Mexico of other people, in particularly from Central America, so that Mexico becomes a corridor through which people are moving in order to get to the United States on the supposition that life will be better there. Um, not always borne out, but that's always, of course, the motivation for people who are desperate that somewhere else might be better. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about the extent to which there is or is not um, NGO activism in that population from the Mexican side as opposed to the US side. So, I mean, I know that American anthropologists or some American anthropologists have been very active in um, fighting for rights for people who don't have papers largely. But I would like to hear what's happening in Mexico and how that might have or might not have changed in the past year. Este, bueno, Mexico is a country expulsor de migrantes. It sends migrants. A la vez que es un país de tránsito. But at the same time, it's a transit country. Y de recepción de migrantes. And the reception of migrants. El tema central es que México. The central theme is that Mexico. Es también un país. It's also a country. Por el que llegan muchos muchos turistas. Which de diferentes partes del mundo. From many different parts of the world. Principalmente de Estados Unidos y Canadá. Principally from United States and Canada. Sí. El tema principal es cómo la movilidad. Now the question is how mobility, tanto de turistas como de migrantes, of both tourists and migrants, hacen de este país, make this country, uh, una una un, una sociedad que debe de dar respuesta a diferentes problemáticas, a society that must answer different problematics. Por ejemplo, en el caso del destino turístico de Cancún, que es la, el principal destino turístico de México. For example, uh, taking into account Cancún, which is the most 
important, uh, Mexico. Esta ciudad es un lugar importante de migración interna. It's, can you say it's an important place of internal migra migration? Al, al que acuden trabajadores de la región de la península de Yucatán y de, y de otras partes de México. Where workers emigrate from different parts of the country. A la vez que llegan jubilados a residir de manera permanente procedentes de Estados Unidos. <laughs> so, so. Again, there is also this effect that um, people from the United States or Canada come to to live to live their, their their final years as a as a form of uh, to, to to spend the last year in in pension. Al mismo tiempo. Mejor título. Sí. Al mismo tiempo que eh, la península de Yucatán se ha caracterizado por eh, tener flujos migratorios que se han integrado a trabajar en Estados Unidos. At the same time, well, we have this intermigration in Mexico. We also have this migration to the United States. So what happens is that we have an inflow of migrants, not only coming to the Cancun for tourism, but also to the United States for a job opportunity. Los turistas llegan a la vez que los migrantes se van a Estados Unidos. So we have this effect that tourists arrive at the same time the national people leave. De manera paralela, eh, se gestan flujos migratorios de personas de Centroamérica principalmente que buscan llegar a Estados Unidos y cuyo interés es llegar a ese país y no tanto quedarse en México. So, talking about the influx of migrants from Central America, we have that they do not see Mexico as the goal. They see the United States as the goal and their objective is to arrive there. So Mexico is more like a mid-train stop rather than the destination. Y esperamos que ahora con la llegada de Biden a la presidencia de Estados Unidos se puedan resolver algunos problemas que tiene la población centroamericana que busca reunirse con sus familiares en el vecino país del norte. In contrast to past administration from ex-president Trump, now we are thinking that perhaps with Biden, the new presidency, we'll be able to relax or at least change some governmental policies to allow the Central America people to arrive to the United States and regain uh, contact with their families. Eh, no, no sé si contesté la pregunta. I don't know if you have another type of questions or comments about the issue. Thank you. Now, I was I was thinking around the the sort of irony of people leaving Mexico, but those who can't afford to leave end up being the caregivers, the domestic workers, and so on for the Americans who come down for cheap retirement and draw on sort of a, a reserve army of labor, if if you will. Um, in order to um, be cared for and, and maintain their life. And there's the, I mean, it really sort of highlights domestically the inequalities within the country and between, between Mexico and other countries, both south to it and north of it. Um, I did say that I was going to ask each of you to ask at least each other at least one question. So, um, Joe, would you like to go first and ask someone a question? Sure. sure. Thank you. Um, I had lots of questions. So <laughs> um, the one I was going to focus on um, is I was thinking, Paola, you know, the recognition of the importance of engaged research um, and what that means in terms of addressing issues around justice. Um, um, so it was really a question to Paula about the importance obviously of engaged research. Um, and whilst that in itself is a field of which there's much debate and I'd love at some point for us to have a conversation around that. How, what I'm interested in, cause it's something that we're also struggling with is what form can engaged research take when we're in this kind of virtual 
um, virtual world, on this online world. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about that. Yes, thank you, Joe. Yes, we're, I'm still struggling with the idea also because, I mean, I believe in, re, in pure research also. I mean, the production of, of knowledge gives you the, the tools to later try to solve other problems. You know, sometimes uh, I felt before I engaged with these NGOs, some people told me, well, you're just being uh, like a... Like a kind of a reporter of bad things. So what are you gonna do about it? So it's, it's been very difficult. We're actually in these projects that I told you and uh, we, are, um, we all almost have one or two meetings every, every week with the communities that started all of this like 15 years ago. And uh, it has been very difficult because they don't have access to internet. I mean, just the, the local NGOs that of course have infrastructure to, or have been accumulating infrastructure for long years, but not the people of the communities. So how can you have engaged, how can you be engaging with them when you cannot be in person with them? So COVID-19 has really um, challenged us but we are, we're trying, we're having, they're having like very small reunions with the local people. And then they come back to us and we start uh, talking again, but it, it has been very difficult. And uh, because the problem is that we, all of the researchers that are working with them, uh, we are, I mean, the anthropologists, but they're biologists, toxicologists, um, there's one, one geographer, and we all have our own work in the university. And, and I mean, it's an extra of what we're doing. It's not really recognized as work because they don't count it in your reports, in your annual reports. They don't, they don't say, oh, okay, cool. You're, you're working with someone, right? Uh, let's keep doing that. It's no, you need to do what you need to do. You need to publish. You need to give, you know, uh, have classes. So it's it's very difficult, and I think it makes it more difficult to work um, in a multidisciplinary way because we have different approaches. Although we've been working for many years, but um, uh, it's difficult to engage and, for example, to access some um, uh, funding the universities at least in mexico are not um are not ready they say okay either is your project anthropological or your project is from biology or toxicology decide you cannot have both because who's gonna who's gonna review your work so i think it's very um it's difficult but i think we're very close to to start it, creating some kind of um, uh, infrastructure in the universities to engage in this kind of, of, of research. And it's, it's that you can have it both ways. I mean, you, you, you could at some point articulate it, but uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> but um, uh, that's, that's what I see. And, and COVID-19 has, has definitely make it more difficult, but I think we can do it. <laughs> okay, Paula, it is your turn to ask a question to someone else. Yes, I, I had a Well, yes, I have many questions too. Um, I have a question because Joe and Kangalani, both of them mentioned the working the minds as a as a very fundamental source of, of migrating uh, uh, workers. And of course, because of the um, uh, environmental issues that push people to the cities. But I, I wanted to ask you what, how's, how has the COVID-19 pandemic played on those movements? Because I don't know, I don't know what, what has been happening in South Africa, if they stopped the work in the mines or in the contrary, because of this uh, continuous movement, the one that Joe's, Joe was talking about, if they're generating more um, infectious transmissions in the rural areas, uh, um, 
as a as a consequence of those movements. So I don't know if you could Tangela and um, answer. Yeah, um, what I can say is that, uh, so the movement to the, uh, to the mines uh, has, was, uh, I don't know whether to say was or is, a tradition, you know, within the uh, Southern African, you know, Southern African economy. So, yeah, so South Africa had, you know, uh, the gold and, and, and the diamond mines and that needed labor from within uh, the, country, but mainly recruiting from neighboring countries, that is your Lesotho, Swaziland, and mainly Mozambique as well. And they also recruited as far as, you know, Malawi and, you know, at some point from Zimbabwe. But uh, with the COVID, so over the years, um, the mines have, you know, uh, become less and less big in terms of, uh, you know, employment but they remain a, a huge source of uh, uh, employment in the South African economy. So um, during the lockdown, I think um, the first lockdown, um, um, they, most of the mines were closed. And then um, there was a gradual, you know, um, you know, reopening. I think at some point it was just maybe 50% of the workforce um, right now, um, maybe Joe can clarify that if they are at 100% uh, operating, you know, uh, capacity. But I would think it is very, very difficult to for social, you know, distancing. But uh, I think the protocol in most instances is for regular, for regular tests. You know, uh, I mean, for those that work in the, especially, you know, in underground. Um, mines and, uh, and, 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 and whatnot. But generally, South Africa in the context of, uh, you know, of the uh, region and, you know, the, the continent has had the most, you know, uh, the most infections. Uh, so, and that brings me to a point that, you know, I, I, I like referring to in terms of South Africa's restrictionism, you know, at a time when South Africa had the most cases but they were posturing, you know, as if uh, neighboring countries were the ones who would be a danger to them. At the very beginning, they built, uh, they started building a, a fence, a useless fence uh, on the border with, uh, with Zimbabwe, you know, uh, and, and the thinking generally was that there will be, you know, a lot of people coming over to South Africa, yet South Africa uh, has, you know, the most infections and over time, it has always, you know, been having the most uh, uh, infections. The other sad reality is that, um, uh, you know, asylum uh, seeker applications have been, you know, closed, uh, you know, since the uh, beginning of, uh, you know, of, 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 the, of the pandemic. So what that means is that uh, there's no avenue for new applications. Uh, I mean, you can't exactly, say to, you know, you can't exactly uh, stop wars uh, because it's a, it's a pandemic, there's still violence, they still, people are still forced to move. But then um, that system is, is, um, is, currently, is currently not, uh, uh, not operating. And um, the interesting thing is that when you contrast that response to that of, um, uh, Uganda, for instance, uh, there was a, a time around uh, July when Uganda opened its uh, border to asylum seekers from the um, DRC in, uh, in in the middle of a, in the middle of a pandemic. But uh, down south, uh, the offices have been uh, shut to new uh, to new uh, uh, applicants. But well, what I can say is that currently, of course, uh, the situation is much better. The, um, there's been a, you know, a, a drastic reduction in, uh, uh, in, in, in cases. So we may not exactly speak uh, so much of the mines per se, but in terms of the general um, you know, population. So there has been a, a reduction in, in, in cases and a consequent um, you know, 
uh, easing of, um, of restrictions. And we're hoping that it stays, uh, it stays like that, you know, over, over the next coming months. Yeah. Kangilani, it's your turn. And since this is how it's worked out to ask Christina <laughs> a question. Um, and while you think of a question, I did want to comment back to Paolo that um, Kangalani answered you in reference to the formal industry, but many people, particularly immigrants who don't have work in other sectors, work Ill doing illegal mining on the periphery of cities like Johannesburg and that's unlikely to have stopped and that's an area where there's very heavy acid mine drainage so there's um, a lot of commonality when when you begin to think around the pollution of industry and extractive industry and its impact on groundwater supplies and on everyday health but also sort of the precarity where people are mining under housing as well. Now, Kangalani, back to you to ask a question of Christina. Yeah, mine is, is, is much more of a, you know, a general question to our Mexican colleagues. Um, I, I have an, an, an interest in, 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 in this dynamic of, uh, you know, Mexico and, uh, and the USA, you know. Um, so as, as people that, you know, observe the trends in, 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 in migration, um, what what are the you know? Um, can, I mean, can they comment on perhaps the previous administration and uh, the new administration uh, in terms of you know the outlook on my on, on migration? Given the position of Mexico as a both, I think um, uh, a recipient and also you know a transit. Uh, country for uh, for migrants from you know uh, from uh, uh, from South America. So if they can comment on some of those uh, dynamics, thanks. Okay, Christina, why don't you pick that up first, and Paula can come in if she wants to add. Okay, I have a question. Uh, do you refer to the change in government in the United States or in Mexico? Just to clarify your question, you you were asking. Uh, I, I think he meant the change in the U.S. Yeah, I also thought. So. I mean, obvi ob obvious, obviously, seeing the similarity between governments that build fences to keep people out. ¿Cuál es eh, tu comentario sobre el cambio de gobierno entre Donald Trump y Biden? Cuando Donald Trump llega a la presidencia. Lo hizo a partir de una campaña muy fuerte en contra de los migrantes, una campaña de xenofobia en donde se culpaba eh, en buena medida a los migrantes procedentes de México y Centroamérica del desempleo y de la inseguridad. So when Donald Trump arrived, uh, his campaign policy was really strong, with a strong focus on a xenophobic approach, right? It, it, it had a, an, a point of view of it, that the migrants were going to arrive with uh, unemployed, that they were really, he, he used the word bad people, bad men, bad hombres, for example. And that was generally his tactic to gain votes. It Y parte de su política fue, además de la deportación, fue la construcción de un muro que impidiera el tránsito, el libre tránsito. Part of his policy was not only uh, the stop of uh, migrant influx, but it was also, it was, there was also this policy of erecting a wall around the two countries. Eh, con Joe Biden. Then vemos que hay un cambio en cuanto al discurso sobre los derechos de los migrantes. Now with Joe Biden, what we can see is that there is a, uh, a change in discourse about migration. Incluso se ha hablado de una reforma migratoria que permite incorporar a los migrantes que han solicitado su ciudadanía en Estados Unidos. There are even news that there is 
talks for a new migrant policy to allow for people to access the country in a more easily man in a more easy manner. Desde luego que esto tiene diferentes problemas que afrontar debido a que eh, cualquier reforma tiene que pasar por el Congreso y tiene que ser apoyado por el, por una mayoría. Now this also um, imposes new problems as any new change in the law has to pass through both uh, houses in, in the United States government. Pero sí notamos que hay un cambio fuerte en cuanto a los derechos humanos, porque ustedes recordarán que como parte de la política eh, migratoria de Estados Unidos durante la era de Trump, se militarizó, bueno, se cerró la frontera, pero además se castigaba a los migrantes a separar a las familias y al dejar a los niños separados de sus padres, por ejemplo. Now we can feel a change in policy already, and one of the most important reasons is that there was a militarization of the frontier. There were new policies that actually separated the families from of migrants. They will start to enclose them in what I will describe as jails. And now with the arrival of Joe Biden, this this take into the matter has changed from the militarization approach to a more humanitarian approach. Bueno, eso sería básicamente, I, no sé si contesté. I think that that's, uh, I don't know if we answered the question. No, yes, thank you. Um, Christina, you now have the last question to ask now of Joe. Yeah. So Joe, actually you get the last word, but Christina gets the last question to get the last word. Sí, claro Joe. que sí. Eh, yo le quisiera preguntar a Kanjolani. Eh, no, a Joe. A Joe. Ah, a Joe. Ah, bueno, a los dos. Eh, si durante la pandemia ustedes han notado eh, una que se ha incrementado la desigualdad en las ciudades y si durante la pandemia los efectos de la, si han notado una mayor segregación eh, con respecto a los migrantes. I would like to ask the question that um, if thanks to COVID, have you noted a more segregated uh, population, a more segregated in terms of uh, cultural or perhaps economical activities? Um, thank you very much for the, the question. Um, yes, <laughs> is probably the, the quick answer. <laughs> um, so COVID has amplified and made all, um, the many, many injustices and social divisions that exist anyway. Um, and I think that we've seen um, you know, the ways that COVID has, has amplified those and made them more and more visible. Um, in terms of issues around, you know, the, you know, you definitely see those who can afford to work from home, those who have their jobs in an online world, um, those who can have their children at home all day and school them, um, those who can afford to shop online versus the majority for whom that's not possible. Um, and for whom, when we see restrictions, whether it's on local movement, whether it's on the ways in which public transport can happen, whether it's on curfews, the impacts on the majority um, are great. Um, and then within that, we can look at all the different sort of socioeconomic, um, I guess, strata, if you want to, if we want to categorize, which I don't like doing, but, and we can see that the, the, the people who already face the greatest injustices and who already face the greatest structural violence um, are the most affected in the context of COVID. And within that, issues around um, non-citizens, foreign nationals, migrants versus South Africans um, is also something that plays out. Um, and when we see land borders, were, this is an example, is land borders were closed. 
So people who rely on land borders in the region tend to be people who are working in potentially in the informal sector, um, potentially are working in what's perceived to be low skilled. Um, they have family in South Africa. They may be studying in South Africa, but they're not the international traveler who is classified as someone who can fly into South Africa. So international airport was open, land borders were closed. And for me, this is one of the most sort of visible performances of forms of exclusion, um, particularly when we know this isn't necessarily sensible public health programming, but it's about the state performing some kind of um, act that it can use to suggest that it is then um, having a positive effect on the containment of, of COVID, but it also performs this idea that the foreign person is somehow responsible. Um, and not just any foreign person, but particular foreign people. Um, and, and I think that we've seen that then manifest as opportunities for the state to justify increasingly restrictive and dangerous immigration policies. So it's all sort of knocking on. So those who already, yeah, like I say, those who are already the most vulnerable to um, injustice um, and challenges that the state places, I think have been the most affected. Okay, thank you. There, now, there are a couple of questions from people who are watching this through Facebook, so I'm going to ask Arturo to put them to you all. Um, Arturo, are you, have you got them in front of you? Yes, thank you. Um, there were so also some comments. Uh, someone said, uh, Paula's presentation shows how realities of imaginaries of good versus bad water can be thought as structural issues in migration flows. Um, and, and then the person asked a question like how to achieve like something basic like hand washing uh, for the population without running water. And I think this is also something that highlights all the inequality issues that we have in both countries in South Africa and Mexico. Um, if, if you don't mind, uh, Lenore, I'm, I'm going to just like mention all the three, four questions that we have and then like different people can give like final thoughts and comments. So that would be the first one. Uh, then the second one, which is also quite interesting, is beyond the negative effects that COVID has had for society. Um, and the question is, ha has it also been an opportunity to make certain problems more visible? And then in that way, I would say like, and, 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 and is it a, like, and how to envision possible so, like solutions uh, to, 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 these, to these problems or issues? Um, then another comment, it's, uh, there is a comment that is a little bit long, but I will read it. It says, Oxfam recently reported that the world's 2,153 billionaires have more wealth than the 4,6 billion people at the bottom of the economic ladder. This deep inequality has exacer exacerbated mass migration to centers of economic wealth, uh, such as Mexico or Joburg, environmental degradation in the interest of industry, et cetera. So the question is, uh, what crisis would arise or actually is arising from this inequality, environmentally speaking, socially and economically speaking, and what possible solutions can, 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 can we put in place to solve these problems? Um, and just the last one is during the current pandemic, uh, talking about migration, I sort of reframed the question, but during the current pandemic, what changes can we see after one year in, term, in terms of incoming and outcoming uh, migration uh, of South Africa, well, in South Africa and of South Africans? Um, anybody could take any of those. Um, let's... Um... Uh, Kangalani, I can see you, so I'm going to throw it to you first, and then, then Christina, then Paula, then Joe. Okay, yeah, all I can, uh, <laughs> all I can say is that um, I think we'll just be reiterating points that uh, you know have been raised in terms of um you know when you look at the effects of the of the pandemic 
uh, it is not exactly a generator of new uh, you know, problems per se, but it just emphasizes or reveals uh, you know, certain lines you know, in the structure of, of, you know, of, of society that have been there. For instance, if you speak of inequality uh, within South Africa itself, I mean, like there's massive, I think it's one of the most unequal, if not the most unequal, you know, country um, uh, in the world. So I think as, as Joy has highlighted, so when now you, have, you add COVID into the mix, so that like it, it kind of drives, you know, um, the people in the lowest ranks further down. And it also foments um, a conflict because we, I mean, those familiar with the South African, uh, you know, uh, environment, they, you would understand that it's already a conflictual, you know, in, in environment in terms of, um, uh, because of the many, you know, economic and uh, social problems, you have people attacking, you know, uh, you know, foreign, uh, foreign nationals, particularly uh, black uh, foreign, you know, uh, nationals in, you know, the widespread xenophobe. So we're most likely to see more of that in the, especially when COVID um, is finally contained, you know, when the people can gather and then, so we're most likely to see more of that. And within, when it comes to internal, you know, to internal um, uh, migration, um, given the, you know, the the uh, the levels of um, of unemployment in the urban centers, so there is uh, obviously like going to be more people. Um, I don't know if um, if it is possible that some people may leave the urban centers and go to. To rural, you know, to, to rural areas due to hardships in the, you know, in the in the cities. But uh, given South Africa's context, that you know, we have a, a lot of people that, in terms of the people that live in urban areas, that are born and and you know and and, and bred in the urban, that consider the urban areas home and without necessarily a home elsewhere in a in a rural in a rural area. But um, what is guaranteed is that we will have more people moving from you know rural areas to the cities, the cities that already do not have uh, enough employment and enough facilities to cater for uh, you know for, uh, for 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 the residents. So it is really a gloom <laughs> picture, you know, going forward. Yeah. Okay, um, the Christina, I'd like to hear from you if you would like to, and Paula and Joe, but there is no pressure on anyone to speak. Then just so everybody else knows, then I'll make a few last minute words and hand over to Arturo, my producer. Um, and then I will go to bed. So it's nearly 4 a.m. So this is, we have a little bit first. So Christina. Yes. Yeah. Um... Es necesario transformar las políticas neoliberales que acentuaron la desigualdad en nuestro continente. It's important to address the neoliberal policies that accentuated the economical drift that we have been living. Se necesita recuperar la participación del Estado en la generación de políticas redistributivas. We need to recuperate the state. Es necesario recuperar el papel del Estado en la generación de políticas redistributivas para eliminar o para reducir las desigualdades. So we need to address the importance of the state to create and generate new policies that redistribute this income inequality that we are seeing. Apoyar el desarrollo regional. We must help regional development. Para evitar que la gente se vea obligada a emigrar. To help the need of people to emigrate to other places. Eh, considero que eh, actualmente se está recuperando esa política de desarrollo social con el nuevo gobierno, y muchos tenemos la esperanza de que haya cambios importantes en este periodo. It is my belief that the current government is actually helping to address these issues and that it isn't bad to develop 
better policies to help un underpin this problem. Lo que nos dejaron las políticas neoliberales fue el des desmantelamiento de las instituciones de producción en el campo y el debilitamiento de la industria nacional. The previous government didn't make the effort to help address the problems, that is the dismantling of the agriculture and national enterprises. Necesitamos transformar esa situación que ha beneficiado al gran capital en beneficio de la mayoría de la población. We need to address the, the current policies to help the burgess population instead of the general population. Eso sería básicamente lo que pudiera yo señalar como posibles alternativas en la política macroeconómica. So in conclusion, we, I believe that they require, this problem requires new policies to address the current situation. And thank you for your question. Okay, Paula. Yes, I will be very, very brief. Um, thank you for the, the questions in Facebook. I don't think we have the solutions right now. I think we're working on it. Everyone is thinking about it. But what I would like to say is that, although I agree with what Kangalani and Christina said, um, I also have a little bit of a gloomy vision of the future because I think that although COVID-19, the pandemic has revealed these um, social inequalities, um, it, ha it has also heightened the cruelty of capitalism. And um, it has heightened the business as usual. People, people are still working and now and they're still moving, but now all of these activities are more dangerous than before. I mean, it's, an, it's, a, it's a plus, the, the possibility of getting infected uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 and, and everything. So I think we have to be wary of the business as, as usual of capitalism and, and try to engage a little bit more, as I said uh, before. But thank you very much for, the, for listening. Joe. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to continue this in this conversation in some way. Um, and I, I suppose just, you know, my final kind of input would really be about, I think we need to use this COVID moment um, as, a, as an opportunity for all of the globally neglected issues it highlights. Um, you know, the COVIDization of research is dangerous, but we also know that COVID is a reality that is affecting um, all of these complex um, and contested um, spaces and challenges. So I, I would like to really use this as an opportunity for finding ways to make visible um, neglect in global health, but neglect in the ways in which we do research, um, neglect in who we leave behind in research, um, and so forth. So I, I hope that we can find ways to move forward in that vein. But thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you all four of you for really stimulating talk and the fact that we've nearly got, it's nearly two hours proves, I mean, just how vibrant it was. I was struck by the diversity and yet the sort of way in which we kept the core. And I mean, I began by talking about climate change as one of the big issues that are sitting behind COVID and I was really struck by the number of play countries that have since then um, come back to that and, and seen COVID as simply a warning of what else might happen and how quickly it might happen. And from an sitting in Australia, I was pleasantly surprised by the extent to which as um, the um, first Lock, the big lockdown, the, which was really the second wave in Australia, but before most people's second wave, as that came to an end, there was a revival of debate about global warming and climate change, and that, you know, we had let one disaster happen on our watch and 
and climate change is going to precipitate a range of other disasters and it is a responsibility. And I think there has been, notwithstanding, Paula, I think, you know, your, your pessimism is well taken, but the growing um, voices around systems of government um, the carelessness of governments and the carelessness and often criminality of predatory capitalism. And I would like to think that that was going to lead to more changes and, you know, increasingly countries, but including in Australia, which performed incredibly badly for some years, you know, are now saying, no, we, we, we do understand this and we will now act. And I think, you know, there are some serious problems looming and one of them will absolutely be that the poorest of the poor, um, including people who migrate because they have no choice but to, will be left behind if there isn't action. And, you know, again, I think that the comments around um, uh, engagement in, with societies and the fact that we cannot do business as usual, um, I mean, has to be taken really seriously. Um, I have more ideas than I'm able to articulate and I and I guess I'm sort of suffering from lack of sleep to be particularly coherent at this hour for me. Um, but I do want to thank the four of you very much for the time you've given to this. And I want to thank Arturo and others working behind the scene for making this happen so smoothly. Um, Arturo, I don't know whether you wish to make any other comment, but I do want to tell um, everybody who is still listening on Facebook that this will end up on YouTube. So there will be an opportunity to listen to this and engage further, at least in, you know, with each other or in your own groups around some of the really important points that these four speakers have shared with us. And um, Paula, Christina, Kangalani and Joe, I hope this is not the last of these conversations with each other and you really have made today a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lenore. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, UNAM colleagues, Paola, Christina and, and Pete's colleagues, Joe and, and Kangalani for your insightful uh, contributions to this topic that it's very relevant and, and that we need to to, to push it forward. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for all our participants and the audience also in Facebook and, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, evening, day. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Goodbye. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>